Welcome to Walking in the Light, our weekly discussion of the Seventh-day Adventist Adult Lesson Study. This week, we're discussing a very interesting topic. It's Lesson 9, and it is captioned, The Foundation of God's Government. A very important study, and we like to dig deep into this study this week. Now, some of you may not have a quarterly. You can go to absg.adventist, absg at adventist.org. I repeat, absg at adventist.org. And you can download for yourself an e-copy. But if you're not tech savvy, you can visit any of our bookstores uh, in your local, and you can have a hard copy, and you can study this very interesting lesson, and other lessons for yourself. Uh, with me to dissect this very important lesson are some illustrious men of the Word of God, full of the Holy Spirit. I will introduce them to you when we come back. But for now, I want you to invite your friends. Call a friend. Invite your neighbors. Let them know that walking in the light is on. And we are going to have a very interesting study. And I want you to stay tuned. I'm Elder Winston Ainsworth, your host for this evening's program. And stay tuned. We'll be right back shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much for staying with us. We are back with you. Uh, we are studying the lesson, Lesson 9, The Foundation of God's Government. This program is under the auspices of SAM and uh, the South Leeward Conference. We are on Radio Land and also on YouTube. So we are broadcasting not only locally, but regionally and worldwide. And so with me to discuss this all-important lesson is to my right, Elabel, Elabel, could you greet the people? A very pleasant good evening, and thank you for giving us your time. I really look forward to uh, discussion and understanding the order of heaven. And uh, thank you very much, Elabel. And to my left is Elder Armstrong. Elder Armstrong, could you greet your friends? Sure, it's a pleasure to be with you once more, to be in your home, and for you to be in, um, here in distance of us. We hope and pray that whatever we have to say tonight will indeed be a blessing to you and to others and even to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elder Armstrong. And if you're just joining us, I am Elder Winston Ainsworth, your host for this program tonight. As it is customary, we'll have the prayer first, which will be done by Elder Armstrong, and then the reading of the memory text by Elder Bell in that order. Let us pray. Loving Lord, it is indeed a pleasure again to be called into service for the King, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the day you have called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. The things that you have exposed us to, Lord, if we have not been, where would we have been? And so we thank you for the opportunity where we can share with others the wonderful words of life. And we ask for your richest blessing upon this platform in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And our memory verse is taken from the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and it's verse chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. It reads thus from the New King James Version. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of the offspring who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Yes, we are going to get back to this memory text shortly. But I want us to focus a little bit, gentlemen, on this caption. 
the foundation of God's government. You know, there are many types of government in the world today, as we speak. We have democratic governments. We have dictatorship governments. We have governments that are socialist and communist oriented. But my question is, by what system does God's government operate? And what is the foundation of God's government? But first, answer the, question, the first part of the question. What do we call God's government? By what system does it operate, Elder Armstrong? Okay, well, first of all, the, I'm happy to hear that the term government is being used because the word or name God is not the name for any one person. It's the name given to the government that governs the universe. And that government governs on the system of love but the system also is governed uh, on the f a foundation called laws. So even love is built on a foundation of laws. The law of love. Ella Bell, what contribution you have to make? What name would you give to God's government? Is it a, a democratic government, a dictatorship? What, what would be the system you would refer to it as? It's difficult to to find anything that's better than love as a foundation. Mm. But what's addition, added to that, it's love makes a way where there seems to be no way. So the government of God opened up an opportunity that is never seen before. Very, very well said. Both of you are correct. When we talk about the system of God's government, we're talking about law. And the name I would like to give to this system is a theocracy. Okay. In a yes. theocracy, we, the leader of a theocracy is, is God mm -hmm. and is not an ordinary priest, is a high priest. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we refer to this leader as a king priest mm -hmm. because he's leading what we call a theocracy, which is based upon the law of love. Mm -hmm. And there's no other better system to rest your government, the foundation of your government on than the law of love. Um, if I may just say a little bit more along the line, because that is where we're headed to, to expound on this. Imagine life without laws. Um, I, life would not be as it is. It would be very chaotic because whatever God creates or makes or whatever you call it, he governs it by laws. And that is why if we throw something in the air and we stand in the right place, it will fall in your head. That's the law of gravity. The sea, when it flows, it stops at a certain place. It's governed by laws of nature there again. And also, when it comes to us as human beings, we too are governed by laws. And that is why we're not able to intermingle and speak to spirits because the human race are governed by certain laws. The spirit world is governed by certain laws. So therefore, we do not cross each other's path and speak to each other for continuous periods. And that is why I realize why human beings who do not like to be controlled by laws prefer um, things like um, spiritism, <laughs> Um, obia, necromancy, magic, we, we, we even like miracles because we like a lot of um, highfalut because we don't want to be controlled by laws. But laws are placed there to govern and control uh, I was about to take you up on what you were saying, you know, because you say we don't speak to spirits. But mm -hmm. I understand the context in which you mm -hmm. speak, because you just made it clear. Mm -hmm. But if God is a spirit, those who worship him, must worship, must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we have a way of communicating with our God through prayer, which is our medium to communicate with that spirit world, mm -hmm. but on a very positive and healthy level. What do you have to say, El I would answer? say that um, if law is taken outside of love, it makes it look like it's a dictatorship. Okay. Just for example, uh, Elder Armstrong raised a question. If you throw a stone in the world, the law of gravity is fixed. Mm -hmm. 
the law of nature has its, its course mapped out and there's no deviation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the law of God, the government, is a law of liberty. Okay. And uh, that makes it adaptable in terms of allowing men who are given free choice <laughs> to accept and appreciate the value of the foundation of heaven. Yeah, I, I, like, I like what you're saying, because even though some of the governments that we have today, the policy, uh, some of it is adopted. Mm -hmm. Some of the policy that they use from the law of God. Because if you kill someone, the police is going to get you. It doesn't matter which system you're mm -hmm. in. If it's a dictatorship, a socialist, communist, or democratic, they have laws that are based upon the laws of God. So they're borrowing from the original. And that's where the theocracy is even better than these systems. Because it is the one that is responsible for the law of liberty mm -hmm. and the laws that guide the governments even today. So they're actually, we will say, piggybacking on what God has put in place. But we have a situation where um, we need to come to the understanding that laws are made to govern subjects. Mm -hmm. Subjects are not to manipulate laws. Mm -hmm. Laws are handed down. So what we have here is that um, if you go back to Genesis, it is clear that there's an issue with God because Adam, he was given the authority to name the animals and name whatever he wants to name. And nobody argued. Up to today, they carry the same name. A donkey is still a donkey. Mm -hmm. um, looks like but God. when God says anything, there's an issue. Because God would say, the seventh day is the Sabbath, and there's an issue. Truly, sin is the breaking of God's law, and that attitude puts us against God. That is what we're seeing playing out down here. And, and you're so right, and that is where we have to go to the memory text, which says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of the offspring, mm -hmm. who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Elder Bell, why is the devil so enraged with the woman? I explain who the woman is, and why is he trying to make war with her offspring? Why is he so angry? The devil, <clears throat> from the time he was kicked out of heaven, mm -hmm. he sought to disrupt the government of God, the authority of God. I'm mm -hmm. so, so right. He sought to um, introduce a system of governance that was so liberated mm -hmm. that there was no order or control. Mm -hmm. he, su he felt he succeeded in 1260 years when it was identified, I mean, literally the, the order of heaven, the foundation of God's government seemed to be under attack and seemed to be pushed back. And so he, he, loved, he celebrated, but air the end of the 1798, or the end of the 2300 day period, which we studied before, of the, which is 1844, the devil then realized he didn't really have the victory. And he realized that he has but a short time. And so he's now going to attack anybody who adopts, by, even by the Reformation, acknowledging the God who has a law of order. Uh, yes. So, so in essence, <laughs> this is indeed a great controversy. That's right. Mm -hmm. That started with Lucifer's mm -hmm. erroneous accusation. Thank you. Against God's character. That's right. His law and God's principles of government. Mm -hmm. So the enemy sat out to create his own, purporting that we are to have our freedom to make our own laws and live by them. So in other words, he's trying to do away with the law. And so he's really upset. I want to use the word upset with the commandments of God. That is exactly what the memory text is saying here. Mm -hmm. He was enraged with the woman who is the church mm -hmm. or offspring, the remnant of that church who are faithful to God's commandments and they're a commandment keeping people. But the devil, whenever he sees God's commandment keeping people, it reminds him that he has lost the battle and he's upset. Well, let, let's face it. Before Sinai, 
the law was embraced as a principle and not spoken or written. So it's like it's obvious when God created humanity and it's all his creation, there was a mm-hmm. level of relationship and understanding. Mm-hmm. It is natural for a, 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 a fowl a, to raise chicken and gather her, her own nest. Mm-hmm. Dogs have their own breed and they, they gravitate to mother. They, they, there's a natural instinct relationship that existed with God and his creation. It was natural. And so when the devil came, because it, the humanity drifted away from God, there was seemed to be a no foundation or no principle on which the people could really or know if they're serving God or not. And so when God decided that this man has strayed so far, he seemed to be losing his relationship, the binding, the covenant relationship. He then expressed the character of himself, the foundation of his relationship in the Ten Commandments. So the devil, therefore, is saying, if I could erode that, they will go back to chaos, for they will not have a governance, a platform, a foundation on which to build a relationship. Yes, that that argument makes a lot of sense, you know, because the only thing that is really keeping him from achieving his goal is the commandments of God. And when that character is replicated Mm -hmm. in individuals, it taunts him. Exactly. And it, it, it gets him and it, it puts him in a rage. Now, remember the whole incident where, well, the story where the Godhead said, come, let us make man. Mm-hmm. But the, the Satan was not included. Lucifer was not included in that meeting, that general meeting. That's, he was left called, out. That, and I believe... That meeting is a council of peace. The without. council of peace and a council of love, a council of creativity, mm-hmm. uh, where the secret of life would have been exposed now, had Lucifer learned the secret of life, there is no way we could have gotten rid of him. <laughs> and so I believe God in his wisdom kept him out of that council. Okay. And so he is so mad with that arrangement, keeping him out of that council, mm-hmm. that he has turned his anger on the people that he was not allowed to have a say in creating. Hence, his rage is against the woman and her offspring. That's right. And the question is, He's not only raging at them, but he's hoping to remove the foundation in principle. Mm. And when we started last week, we saw that God opened the heavenly sanctuary to bring us a, a bird's eye view of the end time situation. And part of that end time situation, it, it, it opened the, the sanctuary to exactly show that the foundation of God's government has not been changed, replaced, or eroded. It's constant. And Elder Armstrong, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? And how is this related to the commandments of God? Or is it more extensive? Well, the testimony of Jesus Christ is basically... You see, this is what we need to understand. When a person approaches the study of God's word, we must approach it from a foundational perspective, where we go from the building up of the salvation history coming forward to our time. So to understand the testimony of Jesus Christ, we have to go way back into the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And that gives us solid foundation and understanding what that is. Because the Ten Commandments itself, when Christ came to this earth, he said, think now I come to change the law. I do not come to change it. But he come to fulfill it. And the law in itself, we have different laws. You have the law that governs the sanctuary service. And you have the moral law, which is the Ten Commandment law. The law of the system of the sanctuary testifies of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you have him living the moral law out in his life. So no matter how you turn it, the laws of God point to who Jesus is, points to who the God that governs the universe is. testifies of him and so therefore the law is also looked upon as a testimony of Jesus Christ because he lived it out in his life that is also known as the spirit of prophecy which is the right way to prophesy about God 
And so therefore, if you want to know if you're part of the correct organization teaching these Bible principles, look for that organization have the gift of that spirit, the correct way to prophesy, the correct way to speak and to teach about God, known as the spirit of prophecy. That is the testimony of who Jesus Christ really is. So I like when you went back to the Old Testament, both the Old and the New Testament is a testimony of the life of Jesus Christ. And um, no wonder he said in Hebrews 10, 7, Lo, I come in the volume, in the volume of the book. Mm -hmm. It is written of me. It speaks of me, Elabel. Uh, a testimony is something that a statement one would give to show that whatever they're saying is true and but, must be backed up with facts. But Elder, I'm so glad that this quarter we're studying the great controversy. Mm. A few lessons ago, we studied that there were two reliable witnesses to testify of the testimony of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> they yes. testified mm -hmm. of the testimony of Jesus. Right, right. And Jesus' right. testimony is a living out of the plan of salvation. Yes. yes. And so what we see here, the, the, the devil was wrought because not only he can't come and say that this thing about salvation is Nancy's story. Because Jesus came as promised in the first prophecy. He promised to come again. And like you said, low in the volume of his work. And Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in their meeting, they are going to they're, they're testify of me. And so we, what we see here, the testimony of Jesus is actually the living out of the plan of salvation. Well, I like, I like that point that you just made because the testimony demonstrates to the entire universe yes. that it is possible mm -hmm. to live the character of God and to, uh, to observe the law and that it is possible to do it because Jesus Christ came and demonstrated it Amen. in real life situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the devil is making an accusation that nobody can actually keep the law. It's impossible. But here we have testimony, here we have facts by the two witnesses, mm -hmm. both the Old and New Testament, yes. that it is possible to keep the law, to observe the law. And, and that is the life of Jesus Christ yes. in demonstration. Yes. Life is the evidence yeah, I like that, that mm -hmm. it's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. So now we're talking about the sanctuary and the law. Mm -hmm. We're going to merge the two. Let's look at Revelation 11, 19. I think we looked at it the last study. We're going to look at it again. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Elder Bell, you can read it, Revelation 11, 19. And Elder Armstrong, you can find Exodus 25, 16. We want to take a look at the sanctuary and the law. Uh, Revelation 11, 19 speaks. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of towers, of peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. hailstorm. Okay. Exodus 25, mm. 16 says, And thou shalt put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Amen. Okay, so we, we, we're talking here about heaven in Revelation eleven nineteen, And in heaven, we saw a temple yeah. which has the ark mm -hmm. of the testament. Yeah. And in that ark, we know we have the law of God, which is the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So this is proof that the Ten Commandments exist in the book of Revelation in heaven. So if it were done away with, as some people preach and advocate that this law is abolished, how is it possible that we can still read about it in the book of Revelation, the very last chapter in the Bible? This disputes definitely the, the argument that they're putting up, that the law is abolished. Because here we see that God is defending it with thunder, lightning, voices, mm -hmm. earthquake, hailstone. They, this to me indicates the amount of power that is demonstrated from observing the law of God, and the impact it should have on anyone who keeps it. That same power that is guarding this law is reserved for you who keep the law as well. I, I, I am um, also, um, I, I, I like archaeology and stuff. I'm still waiting for the, the great finding where some archaeologists would come and say they, they would have found two tables of stone with those commandments. <laughs> they cannot be found. We Why? believe that God has taken them up 
And also the other artifacts I'm looking for them to find is the Noah's Ark. Those things cannot be found. But um, this law that God gave Moses in Exodus 25, 16 says, he's going to give him the testimony. When he gave Moses those two tables of stone, Moses broke the first two. Hmm. God called him and tell him, hew out two more stones. God wrote them over again himself. He didn't leave it to Moses' charge to write them over. And according to the writings, if you examine it, he wrote them on the front and the back. So they were written over four times. And the first time, that must have been the same thing. Okay, front and back, front and back. But there were two tables. One table contained four. The other one contained six. Table with the four, it's your relationship, love relationship to God. Mm -hmm. If you do away any of those, you'll be committing apostasy. You're, you're severing your relationship with God directly. The other stone is our relationship with each other, which is our horizontal relationship. And I did say it one time. When you place the two together, you get the same relationship or same similarity and, and, and description that takes took place at the cross. Amen. Jesus Christ displayed the very same love he even died, died rather dying. And that's where we're going to come to that point. We talk about the faith of Jesus. That's being prepared to die rather than breaking those laws. Yes. What, what, what was great about this, uh, the sanctuary, it's, you, you have to understand, Satan came from heaven where the order was established and was there. So what we see here the, uh, in the Great Controversy is that the sanctuary is open. So this is not something that was given to man after creation. The foundation was laid and established even before the creation of man. Yeah. And, and heaven. And so the sanctuary opens up to show us the blueprint of the government of God. Okay. And so the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the history of God's existence as far as human being is concerned, mm. is revealed with the same principles that he's access and he's written on to tell us. Can I just add to that, yes. Elder, before mm. you say something there? And that is why we are constantly pointing out to planet Earth, just as what the Elder said there, the Ark of the Covenant revealed God's originality Amen. before anything took place on earth. Mm -hmm. That is why the text says sin is the transgression of God's law. Of God's law. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the law was there before sin. Right. Exactly. That's the only way Adam and Eve could have sinned. Well, if you look at the language, right. well, right. Satan sinned right. before right. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. so, so he transgressed that he, law. He is the first person to have sinned. Mm -hmm. So sin is the transgression of something. What is that? God's law. So therefore, if you reverse that, it must tell you that if you are to be converted, you must now become a law keeper. <laughs> uh, you know, it really ties in nicely with what is happening with Satan and his rage. Mm -hmm. Because it is the same law that condemned him. Okay. So he doesn't really like it. That's right. Uh, you know, when we talk about Moses being handed the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Mm. The same thunder and lightning associated same the thing. writing of the law, which was written by God's own fingers. Mm -hmm. And the people at the foot of the mountain said to Moses when he came down, look, next time we don't want anything to do with this God that is so powerful. We are afraid. You go and talk to him, and then you can come back and talk to us. They remove them. They actually remove themselves far from the mountain because of all the thunder and lightning. And I believe that God is really trying to say to the devil, you want to get rid of this law? You try. <laughs> right? And the amount of power that is associated with this law, he can't get close to it. Exactly. And so we could, we could literally see the devil seem to want to put what we call water holes in the law. He so they like become it. leak. Mm. And one of the things he's trying to do is, is to um, erode or to transfer the worship experience. So God says in, his, in understanding and accepting the foundation of heaven, of accepting his creative authority, the Sabbath was placed as part of God's dominant 
um, relationship or covenant of acceptance with humanity. Well, you answer something there, you know, yes. Elder Bell, because what the devil is trying to put holes in the law, as you, as how you, that's how you put it. Yeah. Real entry is trying to compromise it. That's right. To weaken it. That's so it right. has less effect on the observers of the law. For example, we hear about, well, when we go to the Ark of the Testament, mm -hmm. in the most holy place, we see the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. The mercy seat is resting upon the Ark or the Testament or the commandments of God. Yeah. Somebody explained to me, how is it that the mercy seat is able to be married to the law? How do they coexist together? One is talking about justice and okay. the other one is talking about mercy. I'm going to tell you plain as this. I'm driving the wrong road. <laughs> Instead of going up Market Street and coming down Market Street, and a policeman stopped me. And he says to me, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So here it is, I am, I am riding against the law. But attached to that law, which he has control over, is grace or mercy. So he said to me, you know what? It's always that you, you were not fully aware or you were not thinking. I'm going to ask you to turn the car up this road and the, in future. So I'm giving, I'm giving you, I'm extending mercy. So while the law is there to direct order, there is a thing called mercy that says, if we sin, we have an advocate. So you're saying the mercy seat are for really law breakers. The mercy seat, thank you very much. The mercy seat are for those who acknowledge they have fallen short. Right, so then they become under the law. They become the mercy seat. It will become subject to the law. Subject to the law, that's what it really means. The, Ella, I'm sure you, you have see, to say about this. God's kind of law, concepts. we're talking about poking holes or um, compromising. Mm -hmm. God's law is immutable. Mm -hmm. um, when we read the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, we were told that God changes the times, the season, but he never changes his law. Mm -hmm. But here's one who is now come to try to change times and laws, mm -hmm. which is the, the, the enemy. Mm -hmm. But this changing of times and laws, only God can change the times. Only God can change the season. And God will never change his law because God is perfect. So what the enemy have brought among us is the attitude of putting or manipulating God's law to suit ourselves, or making other laws in place of God's laws to even suit ourselves again. So it's as if we can be judge, jury, and execution of our own selves. So he brought this selfishness among us. But in spite of those things, God is the administrator or administrator of his laws. So he is the judge that presides over whether or not you succumb to the enemy's plan, you would have sinned against God. But when you approach him, God will listen to your approach and he will use what is called the spirit of the law to apply what God sees is best to help this person who sinned against him to be reconciled. And that's called mercy. Well, so the administrator sits on the mercy seat because the administrator himself is a God of mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, that's a point I'm trying to get at because some people will tell you that we're now under the kingdom of grace. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying now to say the law is abolished, which is a plan of the devil, mm -hmm. trying to poke holes in the law. But what did they fail to understand? That the law of love shows compassion. Exactly. It, bring, it, it seeks to bring people back into a relationship with the lawgiver. Mm -hmm. And so the mercy seat is doing just so and just that. I, it, I, it reaches out to people exactly. to bring them back so that they can be in conformity like with the law of God. And that's what grace is. Mm -hmm. Grace is giving you another chance to get it right. To get it right. <laughs> yes, yeah. well, you see, what has happened, what has mm -hmm. happened in our time? We have some crafty, cunning speakers and people who claim to be representative of God that tend to have dispensationalized God's grace. Mm -hmm. And that is just another ploy to 
water down or to escape um, the, your, your, your responsibility to God's law. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the keeping of God's law that some um, representatives claim to be representative of God's are bringing to the people of these times belong to a certain dispensation and not to us. Mm -hmm. God has, just as the elder mentioned, even before a human being was created, God's law has always been there. Yeah. There isn't a single second or millisecond where God has never been in, in existence. And as long as God has been in existence, His law has been the same. So we're talking about the immutability of God's law. Yeah. Uh, yes, but in addition to that, we have to bring to the fore that God's law is just Him a, a writing or written or transcript of who he really is yes, uh, or what really he stands is. for. That is him. So, <laughs> so if God cannot change, that cannot change. Because when God wrote that even to Moses, it means then that God wrote a perfect law and anything is perfect needs no adjustment. You're right. Because if the law is God's character, his transcript, if he changes, if he changes the law, you mean that he too changes. Yes. And, and that's impossible because he changes and, not. And this is why Exodus 34, and read from the King James Version. I, I, I have the American Standard Version, but I'd like it from the King James Version, Exodus 34, 5, 6, and 7. You'd be amazed to understand that this relationship between the immutability of the law of God and the love of God as the foundation of his government come together. Yes, Exodus, Exodus 34, what? 5, 6, and 7. 34? Yeah. Okay. It says in from verse 5, yeah, And seven. the Lord mm -hmm. descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Amen. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful, Hallelujah, and gracious, Hallelujah, long suffering Amen. and abundant in goodness Hallelujah. and truth, Hallelujah. <clears throat> keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and yes. transgression of sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty, hey. visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and the fourth. Generation. You understand now? Mm -hmm. So we see here that even before the second witness in the New Testament, mm -hmm. from, the, from the fact that God called a people out of Egypt, he's saying, as much as long as I've been, I'm long suffering, and the Lord, Lord, the Lord, <laughs> twice he called his name the Lord God. He passed by, he says, I am full of kindness, compassion, but I'll need no wise. Clear the guilty. Clear the guilty. That means the uh, strict adherence to the principle. You know why that is so? Because God made provision that if we sin, we can find forgiveness. Yes. yes. So, and God, God, let me just read Proverbs 28, 9, which reinforces yep. what you just said. Proverbs 28, 9 says, He that turned away his ear yeah, from, from hearing, hearing the, the law, law even, even his prayer, prayer shall be an, an abomination. abomination. This is really should this should really be an eye opener mm -hmm. for those who are coming or opposing the law of God. Because yeah. it is said here in black and white that if you don't regard the law, even your prayers will be an abomination. And this is confirming also that if you believe that Jesus died on Calvary, rose again and became our intercessor, for he ever lived to make intercession for us, by you bound to accept, this is what the controversy is saying, and John is saying in, Re in ex uh, Revelation 11, that the heavens open, and in the same spirit of atonement, the law is represented. Yeah, so, but so you cannot separate. You can't separate it too, because the if you're praying, you're praying to the God, of, of law and mm -hmm. order, mm -hmm. and you're saying you don't regard the law. Okay. It's like you're living a life of contradiction. That's right. So if you're going to appro approach a God of law, because that is his character, then you must be in compliance. Otherwise, you'll be living a life of contradiction, mm -hmm. and even your prayers would not be heard, mm -hmm. because he's the one who is the God of, of law and order. But, mm -hmm. but you know, we have an issue mm -hmm. where some of the, the of our Christian friends out there that are not of the same persuasion as ourselves, we Seventh-day Adventists, um, tend to 
think that the fourth commandment can be interpreted differently than how it's spoken. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is one of God's law. And if God's character, if God cannot change, we just established that his, if, if, if he can't change, his character can't change, the law is the transcript or the written, transcribed version of God's character. Why we as God's children believe that we should live by a change of one of his law, by changing from the Sabbath that was sanctified on the seventh day and transfer that sanctity over to the first day. And that is written and demonstrated by a certain organization, the Roman Catholic Church. They wrote it clearly that they have transferred the sanctity of the Sabbath over to the first day. That's attempting to change God's law that governs time. And one of the main reasons, and the question is asked on the Monday, what are some of the reasons why people think that the law of God is no longer arbitrary? I mean, you don't have to keep it. You don't have to abide by it. Hmm. And one of the things is relativity. Relativity means it's adjusted to suit the times to which we have come. Well, God's law is immutable because it has no changes in seasons or out of seasons. And so it becomes adaptable to suit my, quote unquote, my desires, my achievement, my anticipation, and my pursuit in life. Here is where God is saying that his law is immutable. That means everything else evolves, evolves or exists around my, my basic principle. Yeah, but if you examine the law of God, there's nothing antiquated about it. Um, it needs no change because it is relevant for any and every time. Yes. Uh, it Always is so applicable because when we talk about when we talk about the Sabbath, for example, mm -hmm. and the Bible says clearly, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the Sabbath day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Mm -hmm. That is what we will call a day to recognize the Creator. The one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and okay. all that in them is. That's right. And, and, and they are going to worship on a day of their choosing, which is contrary to the day that God chose. What's the difference, really? The difference is that they're disobedient. Well, they don't see it like that. And they're worshiping, but worshiping who? Fine. It is not antiquated because even today people worship. Worship is something that is relevant. Mm -hmm. But why not worship according to the prescription given? That's because I feel whatever, and, and it, was described, it, was, it was expressed in Cain and Abel. Mm. Cain and Abel were asked to bring a specific sacrifice mm. to the table. <laughs> and Cain felt that what I have it better represents me. And there is where the contention began. <laughs> exactly. Where when people decide, you know what, we are going to form commandments of our own. Mm -hmm. Because they're working now in collaboration with the enemy. Uh, and uh, so you find that persons will choose a day that is suitable and convenient for them. And this is what El Armstrong was saying. I need to just break mm -hmm. in the was saying that you can't change the character of God. And so the laws are there to reflect who God is. Now, when I decide I'm giving God what's so com comfortable with me, I remove God from the equation and I become like God. Well, you want <laughs> to play God because you're changing God's law. Now, exactly. you see, that is how the enemy works incrementally yeah. to ultimately remove God from the universe. That's right. You know, I, at one point in my life, I was smoking and ganja. Mm -hmm. I started by smoking a little stick in the back of my yard, mm -hmm. and then I move up to rolling other things and so on. You know, you don't just jump into things head on like that. Mm -hmm. You go into it incrementally. So if we continue to follow the footsteps of this enemy, eventually we're going to be our, become our own God. That's, you, that, that is so true. You know, when, when we look at what God has instituted, as a day of rest mm -hmm. is because he is the creator That's right. and, and he wants the world to recognize who he is because mm -hmm. he cannot change. He mm -hmm. is the creator and will always be the creator. He creates and he recreates. So to observe the Sabbath is not being legalistic. Some people would argue, I mean, that's how to put holes in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The devil is behind all of this, that observing the Sabbath, you become legalistic. Yeah. Well, but how could that not um, be right? Well, you know, mm -hmm. well they, they have this thing where they say that 
not only legalistic, we're trying to um, achieve salvation by works. That's mm -hmm. what they're saying. But when mm -hmm. I check the commandment, it says to me, it's a Sabbath of the day, a day of rest. Mm -hmm. Now, I, that's quite the opposite to work. To work. Mm -hmm. So I, I really can't understand. The enemy have a way of causing us to become confused as if we're babbling indeed. Mm -hmm. Because anything contrary to what God say is babbling, you're babbling. Because God is the source of all truth. However, what the enemy is mm -hmm. ultimately trying to do is to take over this planet legally. So he's affecting the title deed by changing the ownership because the Sabbath has God's seal, his name, his ownership position, and the territory he owns by replacing it with something else that will bear his name of ownership, which is I, the first day I of always, worship. I always believe that this squatter that we're talking about <laughs> is not logical <laughs> in many instances, you know. When you study God's word, you see the logics, yeah. line upon line, how it really mm -hmm. balances and makes sense, mm -hmm. right? But the squatter is trying to usurp God's yeah. authority. And by squatting, you hope that he can get legal rights. But not so, because God is the owner, and the Sabbath reminds us of that. Well, we are worse enemies, you know. God advances us so that we can appreciate our origin and how far we have fallen. And the Sabbath is a constant reminder mm -hmm. that God creates and God redeems. But what has happened, science has pushed us to believe that there's an alternative. And so this is what's happened in the controversy. We have the Sabbath as God's reminder that not only is he creator, but is redeemer and sustainer of his universe. And science is now saying we have an alternative. And that's what the devil is, is suggesting. You don't need to follow the blueprint. You don't need to build on the foundation. We have a, another source so, or another system that could identify as a purpose. So that other alternate system mm -hmm. that we understand from studies, that one day is going to permeate the entire earth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes a global law that man should refuse the seventh day Sabbath and accept the first day which is coming and it's being pushed by this rest in the planet mm -hmm. climate Sunday. When we do not accept that global law, we become lawbreakers. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to be imprisoned mm -hmm. because this will now become the mark of the beast because the beast is going to be used to push this global day. So the whole planet will put aside the Sabbath and accept the Sunday, the first day of the week as the Sabbath because the sanctity of the seventh day Sabbath is going to be transferred over to the first day, and so we will be persecuted for it. Yes. However, mm -hmm. what I want to say, we have a message. Yes. A message. But before you get to the message, Earl Armstrong, mm -hmm. just like the days of the reformer, when we taught the truth was, was driven out of the existence of human mind, God has a people, mm -hmm. a remnant. And this is why this sweet lesson is saying that the rem God, the devil is attacking the remnant for there's still a voice for God. Yes. Well, that is, I like the point that you bring up there because let us look at the strategy the devil is using. Exactly. He's trying to compromise. He's trying to poke holes mm -hmm. in God's law. It's not really working because there is a people. Thank God you. has Hallelujah. a people, Hallelujah. selected people, mm -hmm. a people who will stand for truth regardless or if the heavens fall. Absolutely. And those people are called a remnant. That's and right. they are going to keep the commandments of God and they will have the faith of Jesus regardless of what the devil tries. So mm -hmm. what he does, he changes gears. That's right. And so he's going to use force mm -hmm. to enforce his fake yeah. day of worship. And those who, though there are a lot of people in, in other denominations who are very faithful to God. They believe that they're worshiping mm -hmm. God. And uh, even some of the reformers, the, 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 the truth that God was incremental. And they were, you can't tell me they weren't honest seekers of truth and, and worshipers of God. Mm -hmm. But in these last days, there will come a time when it will be on full display as to who we must worship. Either the God of the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath, or would you worship the, Lord, the God of the Sunday, first day of the week, well, commandments have, of men? I have good news for you. 
the people who worship God in spirit and in truth and keep the commandments, to, and we to Revelation 12, 17, they are identified or keeping the Sabbath day holy. Follow me. Mm. And so they, they have this seal of God. That is a seal of God's creative authority and redemptive authority. Anything else, I'm not talking about Sunday, Monday, truth, anything other than adhering to the foundation and the principles of righteousness is a bark of the beast. Well, um, that is not what I understand, although I understand the principle you're coming with. Mm. What I know, and I have to stick strictly with the scripture, mm. because the only alternative is one. Mm. The, I, I, even now, you have some denominations that hold Friday as mm. that day, mm -hmm. and some hold Sunday. Mm -hmm. In the middle is the Bible Sabbath, seventh day. All right? What I know is in these times, you did say God have a people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Those, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the children of, Is of Issachar are men of understanding of the times mm -hmm. that will know what to tell Israel to do. Mm -hmm. In these days, the enemy will also seek to ecumenize mm -hmm. the messengers of God. Mm -hmm. Cause us, because I've heard some of us even on radio, we're even afraid to mention the, the law of God. We can't talk about the commandments, can't talk about the Sabbath. We talk about obedience. Mm -hmm. We paint a broad brush. Listen, when you read the commandment in the three angel message, the first and the third angel says, saying with a loud voice. Mm -hmm. That means distinctly, you must proclaim to people clearly what is God's law that they can know. This is the clock of the matter. We have a last day message to give to this world, and that is to redirect them to the Creator. Well, we are rewinding down now, and so that's a good note for us to end on our discussion. We can have our final points on it. Now, the three angel message, the first message is calling people back to worshiping the true Creator, who is the Creator, mm -hmm. to worship Him. And if you don't, the second angel will tell you that this system that you're depending on will fall. Babylon mm -hmm. will fall. Yes. And the third angel message says that if you refuse to worship the true and living God, the creator of the world, then you would receive the mark of the beast, mm -hmm. which I hope that none of my friends will ever receive. For, mm -hmm. it, for coming with the mark of the beast are plagues mm -hmm. that will eventually cause you to lose out on God's eternal life and the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wish for that for any one of my friends. Mm -hmm. Ella Bell, what would be your final words? My final words rest with the three angel messages. Mm -hmm. I see the three angel messages. The first angel message is an invitation of those who believe in Jesus Christ to take careful count of their relationship with God. Remember God who created. Amen. The second angel message is, a war is an invitation of warning. But the third angel message is an invitation to people who have not yet accepted Jesus Christ, but who are living careless lives, a warning to say, come out before it's too late. And so the three angel messages are messages of invitation to those who will know Jesus and to those who do not know Jesus yet. Why not surrender now? Yes, and so we'll have to end it here, but we just want to remind our friends that the warning is being given even as we speak. The three of us are actually giving the, the, the angels messages. Mm -hmm. It just happened that we are three of us <laughs> and the three angels messages. So stay tuned for the final remarks and God bless you as you stay tuned to God's word. cut to the chase. The mark of the beast is going to be a real thing that will affect the entire world, as well as the seal of God. Those who are obedient to the law of God would receive his seal, showing that God will claim you as his own. You become his children. Those who receive the mark of the beast will be indicating to the world that you love Satan more than how you love Jesus and you're willing to obey his commandment. Now, even before, uh, I would say as early as AD 538, 
The entire world used to keep the Sabbath as a day of rest. But when Emperor Constantine changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday and called Sunday the day of worship, at that point in time, the plan of the Mark of the Beast was put into effect. But it will culminate at the end of time when the entire world will have to choose who do you worship? Do you worship the God who created the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is? Or would you worship a fake God, a counterfeit God, a squatter? And so the test of allegiance will be before all men. And my brethren and friends, I want you to understand this very clearly. These matters have eternal consequences. It's either you obey the God of life and receive life and have it more abundantly, or you obey the God of death and receive death and receive it more abundantly, for it will last forever and ever, and there will be no coming back into the world of life. I would believe that all of us were born with a degree of common sense and intelligence. And I want you to make a very sensible decision tonight to choose life rather than death. Life on this earth is corrupt and you may not understand the full essence of it. But when God comes and changes this order and he institutes his foundation, his government, a government of theocracy based upon law and order, then you will begin to enjoy the real essence, the real truth of what life is all about. It will be sweet. It will be peaceful, happy, joyous. No more sickness, no more death, no more tears, no more crying. And we will be a happy bunch of people inhabiting the world made new. And so my brethren and friends, you need help. If it is that you need help to make, up a, make a decision and you're calling an election show, call the SLC, call one of the elders or visit one of the Adventist churches close to you and speak to one of the elders and get some direction as to how you can have this life and have it more abundantly. I wish the best for you. Avoid the mark of the beast at all costs is my advice to you. In Jesus' name, amen.